get thirsty Come to the well that never runs dry Drink of the water, come and thirst no more Come all you sinners, come find his mercy Come to the table, he will satisfy Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for
Cause I know you'll make a way And I don't always understand And I don't always get to see But I will believe it I will believe it Cause you make mountains move You make giants grow people said amen. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling yourself do you thirst for a drink from the well Jesus is calling oh come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide forgiveness
with the crown Tell the world of the treasures you found Father God, you are awesome in this place. We lift you up high, exalted on the throne of our lives. This song says so much that we just finished singing. We come to this room hurting and broken, overwhelmed with our sin. We're at the end of our wits and we thirst for that drink from the well. Father, we know you are calling us. We praise you for this moment, Father, as we lift you up, we exalt you. We come to this room to be refreshed, to rejoice, to share in your wonderful uh, grace and mercy. Father, thank you just now. It's in your son's name that I pray. Amen. Good morning. And welcome to Worship with Restore. If you're visiting with us here either in person or online, my name is Aaron. I'm the lead pastor of this community. Um, and something that I also function as is I'm the lead uh, planter uh, of this church as well. Back in 2018 was a year that changed my entire life. Um, not only did I get married, but we started our entire lives over as soon as we started it together. Uh, we had an opportunity to transition out of the ministry that we are presently in um, and come to Highland and start a new ministry, start a new church here. And my initial response was no. And then my second response was a continued no. And then eventually God revealed to us through many different individuals and circumstances and situations that this is exactly what we were called to do. So we moved um, here and uh, we had some connections, but our connections were in Chicago. Um, our sending organization, Ignite Church Planners, is based in Chicago. We are their first church plant, first I would say successful church plant outside of Chicago land in northern Illinois, Indiana. Uh, so this was trying something new for them and trying something new for us. So I like to tell them that I was just their guinea pig for the time. But they had some oversight, but essentially like we got dropped in here with nothing. Like the, the Restore Christian Church, when it was like accepted by the U.S. government as being incorporated was... Allison and I, and the address was 15 Crown Point Boulevard, Apartment B. <laughs> and we had to start from scratch, everything, completely from scratch. And we had nine months to do it. There was some initial funding that was offered to us, but ultimately, like, we had to go fundraise. And so... I remember I went to, the, I went to these, these two churches, these two really big churches, and I was like, okay, I'm going to make my ask. I had oversight everything, and I got no. And then the second one I went to, no. And over and over and over, I kept getting no, no, no. Like, I was like, I thought I was supposed to do this, God. Like, I moved here. We changed everything. Like, gave up everything to start over. And I keep asking people to either come help me start this church, no. Help me with some finances. No, over and over and over. And so now I'm just like, and some people, I mean, outright like, no, we don't think you can do it. Like, we don't believe in what's going on here. So that was hard. So I started questioning it all. And it was at the, around that same time that our development director, his name is Jared, um, got me connected with another Jared, as here today. Um, and I sat down with Jared at Panera in Edwardsville, and I cast the vision, as I had done several times before, got no, no, no. And literally, at this point, you know, Restore is just an idea. It's just on paper. Like, I got no, nothing to show. I share it to him, and he says, okay. And I'm like, what? He's crazy. No, he's not. Jared is a, one <laughs> Jared is a wonderful man. He has been a pastor, a church planter. He's a father of, what, a dozen? No, seven yeah, six, okay, six, um, and Jared represents an organization called CFR, so it's Christian Financial Resources, and they help churches, and um, specifically restoration movement churches that, like we are, um, when it comes to just managing funds, investments, and things like that, and so they were one of the first people to partner with us, um, and they have retained a relationship with us from the very beginning, so all since 2019, 
Um, and it could have just stopped there. It could have just been like, you know, they're just going to help us with financial stuff. But uh, Jared and the team at CFR have com- continuously um, worked with um, myself and Josiah and Allison in offering, like helping us with stay when we travel and we go to conferences. Or Jared, when he comes down, he always spends time with us. And, and does so they go beyond just financial help, but they also offer discipleship and encouragement. And for that, um, I am very, very grateful. So um, with that being said, Jared is here today, and he's going to deliver our message. Um, I think that's a pretty good intro. That's awesome. um, can, can you travel with me and introduce me everywhere I go? <laughs> that would be really helpful. You can keep that. Oh, yeah. Well, it is, it is great to be here this morning. Um, I'm a native of um, Illinois. I grew up in West Central Illinois, a little town called La Harpe. That's okay, nobody else has heard of it either. Um, but it's about 25 minutes drive from Macomb, Illinois, where Western Illinois University is. Yeah. Um, I went to college in Missouri, met a beautiful redhead there, and she was from Wisconsin. And one of our first dates, I said, Joanne, I, I just need to let you know that if this goes anywhere, I can never live in Wisconsin. Uh, good news is I've only lived in Wisconsin for 21 years. It's kind of fun. My son is actually in grad school. My oldest of our six is in grad school at SIUE. And he is having some car trouble currently, so his girlfriend drove him home for Christmas break. He needed to come back, and it happened that this weekend was when he needed to come back anyway. So he and I got to be on the same flight uh, into St. Louis to help him come back. And I got to take him to, to uh, Sam's Club and Aldi yesterday to stock his refrigerator, refrigerator for this semester because he doesn't know when his vehicle is going to be running again. And I get to take him out to lunch today because if dad's in town and offering a free meal, of course you're going to take, uh, take dad up on that. So uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here at Restore again. And it is the beginning of a new year, right? Welcome 2024. How many of you have made New Year's resolutions for the new year? Okay, a couple. <laughs> How many of you have already broken the resolution for the? So, so I I started. I'm I'm a runner, and uh, January first, the weather was kind of kind of decent. I thought, looking at the temperature, uh, we now live in the Milwaukee suburbs. I'll just tell you, any if you live anywhere that Chicago is down south, like you probably shouldn't live there. But that's where I live. And January first, it was like a nice day, kind of. It was a little bit windy, and so I thought I'm going to go for a, a, a run. And I did, and I thought, if I run today, that's the first day of the year, I could see how much of a streak I could keep running every day. I've I've done that before, just usually not in the winter. And I thought, but I'll I'll try it. Well, it was kind of windy, and so it felt colder than I expected. And my streak of how many days in a row was one. I I broke it on the the second day of the year. Statistically... 38% of people have resolved to never make a New Year's resolution again. So maybe you're in that camp, but most other folks do. And uh, Forbes recently put out a list of the top 10 New Year's resolutions for 2024. See if you made a resolution that fits into any of these categories. Number 10 was to improve work-life balance. Number 9, make more time for hobbies. Number eight, learn a new skill. Number seven, stop smoking. Number six, make more time for loved ones. Number five, improve diet. Number four, lose weight. Number three, improve mental health. Number two, improve finances. Number one, improve fitness. Interestingly, Forbes also noted that mental health being down to number three That was actually a shift down that the previous two years it had been number one. Assumption is the post-pandemic era, kind of people struggling with mental health and isolation and all of that. So maybe a good sign that that has has moved down. And historically, fitness tends to be one of the top always. Like everybody knows not to go to the gym January 1st to the 15th because it's too crowded. Because everybody's there with their New Year's resolutions, right? And we know what typically happens. We make those resolutions. According to the same survey... The vast majority of resolutions die around two to four months into the new year. Now, that's longer than uh, some other statistics that I had seen that said usually by two weeks in, those resolutions are already broken. Uh, And so we, we tend to be in this cycle. We make a resolution, we break a resolution, we get frustrated, and we say, okay, well, maybe maybe next year. Maybe next year will be the year that I stick with it. Maybe next year I'll spend more time with family, help others more, get healthier, get in shape, whatever. 
what if maybe next year actually happened, though? Any Cubs fans here? I realize we're pretty down, far down. Okay, we do have some Cubs fans. It's okay. We may need security protection for them after. Um, but maybe next year happened in 2016, right? Yeah, maybe next year finally happened. After a 108-year drought, the World Series win happened. So let me ask you, what if this year could be different than all the previous years? What if instead of being frustrated early in the year and say maybe next year, we could do something that we could stick with this year that would make this year different? A while back, I learned something I found interesting, inspiring. Uh, it's something I hope will maybe interest and inspire you as well. A lesson from history. Now, before you zone out because you're like, oh, great, history, before you're insta post with hashtag nap time, just stick with me for a little bit, okay? The year was A.D. 400. The Roman Empire had pretty much fallen apart. Europe had been invaded, invaded by a bunch of barbarian tribes, the Gauls, the Visigoths, the Vandals, other barbarian groups, most of them coming from the east. And Europe became this patchwork of warring uh, pagan tribes, war, superstition, bloodshed, violence, darkness, the capital of Christianity during that time was actually moved. It had been in Rome, and it was actually moved to Constantinople, basically out of Europe into what is Istanbul today. The church in much of Europe fell into disarray. In some places, it seemed to disappear altogether. In the beginning of a, a period of time in Western civilization that we perhaps appropriately call the Dark Ages, an era of darkness, uh, in a lot of areas, there was a lack of civil authority, no reliable system of justice, no organized education system, a time of, of chaos and darkness and disarray. But after a couple of hundred years of that, beginning in the 7th century, another group of people moved through Western Europe. And they came from a little bit of an unlikely place, an area considered insignificant, unsophisticated, irrelevant, Celtic monks from some islands in kind of the far northwest of Europe started coming to Western Europe from their home islands, and they began to bring light to the darkness. They were a ragtag band of unsophisticated, unlikely, courageous missionaries who came to mainland Europe to bring the truth of Jesus back there. They, in some historians' view, saved Western civilization from the darkness that had, had taken over much of Europe at that time and really the whole Western world. And so some people would say these Celtic missionaries saved thousands and even millions from a Christless eternity because of their efforts to share his light throughout Europe. And we're going to talk a little bit about how they did it, how they changed the world and transformed history and they did it by orienting their lives around two places, two circular spaces, if you will. And the first one was known as the cell. The cell. Now, we think of a cell and we think maybe a prison. That's not what it was for them. Celtic monks lived in a community where they would each have their own circular stone hut, kind of like this. Their community would have a monastery in the middle where they would gather for uh, sessions of worship, for instruction, for any of their group gatherings. But then they would return to their individual huts, their individual cells for personal reflection, for commitment to spiritual disciplines like studying scripture, praying, confessing sin and repenting of that sin, meditation. They would gather to worship and then go to their individual cells to continue to pray and reflect. And it wasn't about just trying to improve themselves as Christians, trying to become better, more holy followers of Jesus. In their cells, yeah, they learned to be closer to God, but they learned to deal with their sins and weaknesses, to, to tame and, and curb the appetites, the impulses that would get in the way of the purpose that they believe God had called them to live out. In these cells, you could almost imagine them flexing and unflexing their spiritual muscles as kind of getting into spiritual shape, exercising those spiritual disciplines to become more spiritually fit, to be the kind of people they needed to be in order to go out and be the missionaries they knew God wanted them to be. 
So they spent time being transformed in the cell into the disciplined, godly, loving, just, peaceful, spiritually devoted people who would ultimately change Western Europe. So that was one round, circular place they committed themselves to, the cell. The other was also round, but served a different purpose, and it was called the coracle. A coracle was a small one- or two-person boat, a wicker boat typically, light enough that you could carry it on your back over land, and then when you came to water, you could put it into water. And so what these Celtic monks would do, often in pairs... They would take this coracle, one of them would carry it onto their back. They would go to a waterway, a river or an ocean, and they would pray and ask God to use the wind and the waves and the currents and the tides to take them where he wanted them to go to take the gospel, the good news about Jesus. So they get into their boat then, and wherever that boat bumped up against the shore, that's where they would get out. And they would believe God had directed them to be missionaries in the place where that boat landed. Wherever their coracle took them, that was where they believed they were called to be missionaries, to bring the light of Jesus. So in the cell, they became, they became fit for service. In the coracle, they were transported on mission for Jesus. And the result was not just more converts to Christianity, the result was the light of peace and justice and love and kindness and hope being brought to a world trapped in the dark ages. These Celtic monks, they were kind of rough and tumble. Uh, they were largely uneducated by today's standard, their only education being what they experienced there in the monastery, not having much written education in childhood as they were growing up. But they were totally committed wild men, if you will, to this life of mission and multiplication and transformation wherever they went. And so this people dedicated to the cell and the coracle, in some people's minds, saved the world that they were a part of. They were committed to bring the light and peace of Jesus to a world trapped in all kinds of darkness. And that devotion to the cell and the coracle helped save the world. And so we have these two circular shapes that represented their two commitments to change the world. So thinking about this, this idea of a cell of, of personal spiritual discipline and the idea of a coracle, of a, a personal world-transforming mission, it's really a rep representation of a concept we see lived out by example in a number of cases as we read the Bible. People who committed themselves to spiritual development and devotion, and then out of that committed themselves to living a life on mission for God. A great example is the story of Daniel. And so if you have a Bible with, with you or you want to pick one up under the seat, if you want to go ahead and turn to Daniel 6, we will be there in just a minute. I grew up going to church and uh, was in Sunday school every week as a kid. And, and so multiple times growing up, I heard the story of Daniel in the lion's den, right? And that is a pretty cool story. Daniel's thrown into a den of lions, but God sent an angel who closed the mouths of the lions so that Daniel survived and they didn't harm him. I mean, that's a pretty cool story. But what I often didn't hear about was what led up to that. How was Daniel prepared to live on mission in a way that ultimately ended up in him surviving the, the lion's den? Daniel was an Israelite. He was part of the nation of Israel. They were descended from a guy named Jacob who also had the name Israel, who was himself uh, descended from his father Isaac and his father Abraham. And the descendants of Abraham, through Isaac and Jacob, recognized they had been asked by God to do something, to, to sort of live on mission in the world that they were in. God had made an agreement with them that he would reveal himself to the world through them, and to help reveal himself, he would bless them, but they had to do some things, they had as part of the agreement, their end of the bargain. And so if they would follow his commandments in a way that they would stand out among the people around them, then he would bless them and reveal the world, uh, reveal himself to the world through them. And sometimes they remembered that, and it was great. 
And other times they forgot that and abandoned his commands. And so then God would remove his blessing and their enemies would come into Israel and kind of whoop up on them a little bit. And they'd say, oh, no, God has abandoned us. That's right. We abandoned him first. They'd get recommitted to God and this cycle would kind of repeat. Well, in the life of Daniel, the kingdom that came in and took over Israel because they had walked away from their commitments to God were the Babylonians, the kingdom of Babylon. And when Babylon conquered Israel, they didn't just take over. They also took some of the best and the brightest people in Israel, especially the young uh, nobility's children, took them to Babylon to learn the ways of Babylon. And Daniel was one of those people. We see examples in Daniel's early days of Babylon, how he chose not to simply conform, but to remain faithful to what he believed God had called him to. One example was when it came to what he ate. Daniel chose not to just conform, but stood out because he chose to do things differently to remain faithful to God. We live this life of commitment and purity and devotion and discipline, and we read that he was in prayer and dedication in his version of the cell, in his dwelling place, much like the Celtic monks uh, that I I first heard about, that whole story of the, the cells and the coracles from a guy named Michael Frost years ago. But in a similar way, Daniel was committed to spiritual disciplines, to developing himself spiritually in his own private places. Here's what we read, Daniel chapter 6, going down to verse 10. Three times a day, Daniel got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God. So Daniel had this place, we'll look later and see that was where he lived, where he practiced spiritual disciplines, and it made him different in good ways. Let's go back earlier in Daniel chapter 6 to verse 3. We read this. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. The king was planning to give Daniel some pretty significant authority over everything that Babylon controlled. For years, Daniel had committed himself to spiritual disciplines, dedicated himself to God and learning about him in his own version of the cell. And when Daniel got this appointment to be basically the the right-hand man to the king, other leaders in Babylon weren't too excited about it. And so we read in verses 4 and 5, Daniel chapter 6, At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. His spiritual disciplines paid off in his character. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So the result of Daniel's dedication to private, personal, spiritual growth, it was so evident in his life, his enemies decided that was the only thing they would be able to use against him. These enemies approach the king, basically trick him into issuing a law that anyone in the whole Babylonian empire who prays to any god other than the king is going to be thrown into a den of lions. So far, Daniel's life in his, person, in his personal cell, it had pretty much just complemented his life. It had resulted in benefits for him. But now, if he remains committed to that, what is the price going to be? Death. But as you know, if you're familiar with the story, or you might be able to guess from what we've heard so far, Daniel knew to follow God and be on mission for him, he could not abandon the spiritual disciplines he committed himself to. And so here's what happens. Verse 10 that we read earlier actually follows all this stuff. Daniel praying comes after he knew he would be killed for doing so. Verse 10. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. See that? Just as he had done before. Before. This was not a due discipline for Daniel. It's something he'd been doing. It was a, a, a habit, a pattern he'd already established. And the rest of the story then is what I learned in Sunday school. Because of his actions, Daniel does get arrested. He gets thrown into the lion's den. The king is grieved. He didn't realize he'd been tricked into this law. He actually wants Daniel to survive. He's pleased when he sees that Daniel is, is, uh, is protected. 
And look at the king's response then afterwards because of Daniel's behavior. Then King Darius, verse 25, wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth, I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. How's that for Daniel's impact? How's that for living life on mission for living on mission for God wherever the wind and the waves and currents of life had taken him right in the heart of Babylon Daniel changed the entire kingdom because of his commitment to those two places in life if you will his commitment to spiritual disciplines in his cell and his commitment to live on mission for God in the coracle the place that life took him so what if instead of the whether it's the rental car or whatever. And so I just wrapped up two years in a row of listening through the whole Bible in a year thanks to a couple different podcasts, different ones I used each year. And this year I've shifted, uh, shifted that a little bit. There's a, a men's daily podcast that goes through the Bible that has some devotional thoughts as part of that as well. And so I've chosen to make my vehicle my cell for 2024 and beyond. The second thing I want to challenge you to do is to set yourself adrift in a small boat on the Mississippi and see where the waters take you. Okay, obviously not. At least wait till it warms up a little bit, right? 
No, you don't need to do that, but here's what I do want you to, to do. I do want you to pick your coracle, your equivalent of that. Where is the place that the currents and tides of life by God's providential working has already taken you? That you can bring the light of the gospel, the truth of Jesus and what he's done for you to the people around you. The Celtic monks, yeah, they got it in a coracle, and where the literal waters took them is where they lived on mission for Jesus. For Daniel, it was being taken as a captive that carried him to Babylon, and that was the place he lived a life on mission for God. For us, what I challenge you to do is assume that at least one of the various places where the winds and waves and currents of life have brought you currently to identify one of those as the place you believe God has called you to live on mission for him. It might be your neighborhood, your city, your school, your workplace, your own home, if it's a place desperately in need of light and love and peace and mercy. It might be your bridge group, your poker buddies, your kids' play group, play group the, the gym where you work out, Pick, you're going to have to stay there longer than January 15th, though, if that's going to be the place. Just pick that place, identify it as where God has carried you so that you can bring about the change he wants you to bring there, your version of the coracle. And remember, this is bigger than just a, a little habit that we hope will tweak a little something about our lives. It's about living a life on mission that has true impact into eternity for the sake of Jesus. And many of us, we're already on, on some kind of mission as a, a part of volunteering, as a part of a, a team here at the church. And that's awesome. Maybe this time next year, someone in your place, having been visited by your coracle, maybe someone as unlikely as a Babylonian king will be compelled to utter those unbelievable words we read earlier that King Darius concluded because of you choosing to live your life on mission let's read those words again from the king's decree he is the living god and he endures forever his kingdom will not be destroyed his dominion will never end he rescues and he saves he performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth this can be the year we don't have to keep making new year's resolutions that we'll abandon in a few weeks Maybe next year's on a small scale. Instead, we could make 2024 the year of our cell, spiritual development, and our coracle, world impact, so that others change their perspective about God, just like King Darius did. Let's pray together. Father, give us those signs, those wonders that King Darius talked about for 2024. Father, show us your power Encourage us as we seek you in the cell and find our mission in the coracle. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, thank you, Jared. Um, kind of a continuation of, of what Jared was sharing with us today. I want to give us a good example of yet another habit that we can participate in daily. Um, right now we're entering a time of communion, um, but communion is not just something that we have to keep to a Sunday morning service like this. Um, communion is a communal reminder to practice the habit of approaching God, talking to God on a daily basis too. Um, the new year is often a time for us to try and establish new habits, kind of as Jared pointed out to us. But this year, I would encourage you to start this simple habit on a daily basis, to have communion with God, not just on Sundays, but every day. Um, and you don't even need that little cracker and juice to do it, but certainly you can if you want to. Um, just talk to God a little during your morning commute or in the shower. Um, Jared gave several other great examples of places that you can choose. Um, and ask God to show his presence to you throughout your day, to give you opportunities to care for others. Um, in Matthew 26, that's the chapter where we see Jesus kind of establishing this practice of communion that we practice together. Um, but in that same chapter, 
at the end of it, we see the story of Peter's denial of Jesus. And in the establishment of communion during that Last Supper, Jesus um, tells Peter, hey, like, you need to be careful to not deny me in your daily moments of life. Um, even though you are present here in this Last Supper room, in this experience of communion, you need to pay attention and have the daily habit of communing with me in your everyday life. And we, we know at the end of that story that Peter does end up denying Jesus, not once, but three times. Um, and he is just crushed with the guilt of that. And Jesus says, it's okay, but that's why I warned you, that this needs to be a daily practice, that you're not just communing with me here on Sunday mornings, but you're communing with me every day in your daily lives. So now that's not to say that if we don't practice communion on a daily basis or prayer or whatever, that we're denying God, but it certainly makes our relationship difficult. Um, it makes us harder for us to see God's presence in our lives. It makes us harder to hear um, when he's commanding us to care for someone as well. So I would just challenge you this morning to, um, to take this communion experience together with all of us, but to not just let it stay as a Sunday morning practice, but to make it a daily practice. Um, here at Restore, we practice open communion. Um, so... Anyone who considers themselves a believer, no matter your church background, um, as long as you accept, have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are welcome to participate with us. Um, there's also baskets over there for an offering if you feel so led. There's no obligation whatsoever, but it's there if you um, feel so led to share. Um, would you pray with me this morning as we prepare for communion? Dear Jesus, um, I just want to thank you for this opportunity that we have to gather here together this morning um, and to just be in your presence with one another as well. God, I pray that um, as we approach this communion table, um, that we would take this as a moment of practice, um, to, to practice communing with you alongside other people and to then take that with us in our daily lives and find those small moments to place ourselves in that, that cell that Jared talked about, and to have a, the spiritual discipline of prayer, um, to just spend time with you, God. Uh, I thank you for um, sending your son to die and, and then resurrecting him to give us eternal life and um, to provide us this community that we have here this morning, God. I pray that we not forget that in this practice of communion and in our daily practice of communion as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, you may partake when you are ready. Yeah. 
You can figure this out. I don't know. <laughs> check, check. Thank you. <clears throat> we'll stand over here. Um, all right. I don't, I don't even know. I had a joke about the song that was playing during communion, but I was like, it's like so Celtic. It was like feeling. Like, I noticed that. It also. like, yeah, it like went on. I've well never done. heard that before. Well played. Braden, Literally. Well Braden played. had a great transition into um, <laughs> from the sermon into the into the message. Um, so thank you, Jared, for coming. Um, I'm just going to have you share just real quick um, just about CFR. So if you could tell them a little bit of what CFR is and how they help churches? Yeah, CFR was started in 1980, specifically as a church extension fund. That means we were started to be able to provide loans to churches that were growing, that needed to purchase land or build a building. And some seasons, uh, other lenders are very willing to work with churches, and other times they kind of pull back and are hesitant. Well, how, do, how do we underwrite a church to know if it's a good loan or not? And so because we've been doing that for 43 years, we've come to know churches really well. We know what to look for. We know how to come alongside a church. Uh, the, the Bible has a lot of warnings about debt. And so we want to make sure if a church is uh, making a decision to take on debt, that they're doing it with some good biblical counsel and taking a, a faith-based perspective when it comes to managing that debt well. And so in our 43-year history, we have funded over $1.3 billion, that's with a B, in church loans, nearly 1,000, I think it's 971 uh, churches and related ministries uh, that we have funded in that history. And our passion is working with churches to try and be the best stewards of their finances as they, as they can be. And that includes we as a nonprofit can keep our overhead really low and we try to pass that on in the form of lower interest rates uh, so that the churches spend less on the cost of their facilities and can deploy more into their community uh, in ministry outreach missions. Yeah. Um, like I said already, like Restore, we've partnered with them for, I guess, almost five years now. Um, but it, can you can also tell them about just different ways that they can partner with CFR individually because it's not just something that like churches work with. Yeah, you know, um. people people often ask about where where did you get the funds to be able to make the the loans to all of those churches over the years, and the reality is we have a model that is rooted in the example of the early church. In Acts chapter four, we read that there was no one in need among them for those early followers of Jesus. Why? They shared what they had. And that's exactly how CFR works. We are able to make loans to churches because people like you and me across the U.S., uh, including business owners and churches as well, 
invest dollars at CFR, and then those dollars are used to make the loans. So there's a brochure like this that if you open it, you'll see the different ways that you can partner with CFR to help us fund ministry and change lives. Uh, we have a slide about something called Ready Access. Uh, that's a demand investment you can get to anytime. I know we've talked about that for you guys, uh, that, that you can connect to a local checking account and move funds back and forth as much as you need. We never charge any fees on it. Uh, so that's why it's called a demand. With that online access, you can move funds to one business day ACH either way. And it's available for that emergency, but a place that you know, not only are you getting a rate of return, as it talks about here, but you also know the only thing we're doing with those dollars is we're helping churches. I'm not an investment advisor who earns commissions by helping you choose stocks or mutual funds. That's not, that's not what we do. The only thing those dollars are being used for is making loans to churches. We also have time certificates where you can lock in a higher return. We have an example of one of those uh, on screen. You can get a little bit higher return on your investment by making that time commitment. That includes rolling over an old retirement account. Maybe you have a 401k from a previous employer that you could uh, roll over as an IRA at CFR and again, get that blessing of knowing that it's just being used to help churches. And then we have a giving fund. It's sort of like a charitable checking account. You can continue to support the ministries that you love like Restore, but it has some significant tax advantages. Uh, and so especially for folks who are giving $10,000 a year or more to charity, that can be a great tax win for you with your own finances. But again, ultimately, it's about stewardship and knowing that those dollars at CFR are just being used to help churches. So if you want to find out more, there is uh, a QR code on the screen, or you can also text uh, following the instructions that are on there if you'd like to fill out the form there, provide your contact info. I have a table over here with some additional information. You can pick up a packet like this that has everything that you need to get started would be happy to answer any questions, obviously, while I'm here today, or you can leave your contact info, and I'll be happy to follow up. And, you know, I can always take an excuse to come visit my son. Uh, and so, like, if you request, hey, I, I need to sit down and talk to you in person, okay, we can, we can make that happen at some point, too. So thank you for the opportunity to be here, Aaron. Always great to connect uh, with you all here, and I'll take any opportunity to come to the tropical southern Illinois uh, climate to get me out of Wisconsin this time of year. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Jared. Without further ado, I introduce to you Kim Petzing for announcements. Wow. Yeah. All right. We do have a few announcements. Um, tomorrow night is the Women's Ministry Dinner in Devos. It will be at Elf Flanagan's, or is it E.L. Flanagan's? Oh, okay. Sorry. I am not from Highland, as you can tell. E.L. Flanagan's here in Highland. It's tomorrow night at 6.30. Um, be sure to come, even if you haven't read the book, it's uh, just to talk through the devotional and just to share some good stories and good times in fellowship together. Then on Saturday, this coming Saturday, is the men's prayer breakfast. This one will be at the Huddle House. I didn't say that one wrong, at least. What? Okay, do we have an alternate location yet? At ease, new ownership, oh, okay. Well, uh, at location TBD, and we'll be communicated with the group, but uh, this coming Saturday the 13th at 9 a.m., so be sure to come out for that if you are available. Next up, our all-church annual meeting is going to be Sunday, January 28th, right after service, so be sure to plan some extra time to hang around afterwards. They're going to talk about the church's vision, direction, and goals for the year, what they're working toward, and how they're doing it. But at the same time, uh, during this time, they're doing a leadership review. And um, as we're moving into the new year, they're looking at the folks who are um, in the leadership positions. And so if you have any questions, any concerns, anything that you would like to bring up or talk about um, with the existing deacons, pastors, or elders, please talk to Paco or to Aaron and let him know any thoughts that you might have and wish to share. And I think that's it for the announcements, but at this time I need to ask Allie to join us up here for her announcement. 
There you go. Hello. Um, I think most of you know me. If you don't know me, my name is Allie. I'm Aaron's little sister. Um, I'm not around here as much anymore because I am in grad school right now. Um, so I'm in North Carolina. But I just wanted to come up here and talk a little bit about an opportunity that I have um, for this summer. Um, so I'm, I'm about to go back to school, so I won't see you guys for a while um, because I have been chosen to work with an organization in Tijuana, Mexico this summer. Um, so I will be down there. It's called La Casa del Migrante, um, which translates to the migrant house. I will be living with people in Tijuana who are just displaced people, whether that be um, just homeless people, people who have fled to Mexico because of violence in their countries, um, people who are about to cross the border, or people who have recently been deported. And I'll just be living with them, um, learning from them, and um, helping provide basic needs for them, whether that be housing, food, clothing, um, medical help, documents. Um, the organization does all of that stuff. And so I don't know fully what I will be doing yet, but I will be down there. Um, so I just wanted to share it with you guys um, so that you could be praying for me um, as I'm going to be down there um, all summer. Um, so if I could have uh, Paco, Josiah, um, I guess, uh, Taylor, do you want to come pray for Allie? Allison? Anybody else? I always ask that you, what? I just, I just started bringing everybody up here. No, if, if anybody else would like to, to pray over Allie or be um, an extension of the prayers that we're going to be lifting up right now, we just ask that you raise your hand. Um, while we pray, and that, and as a sign of laying of hands, um, we practice here at Restore something that may look strange to some people from different backgrounds, which is called laying of hands. But it is something that is passed down by the disciples to us as a sign of favor and a sign of blessing upon the person. Um, and so we essentially is it's meant to illustrate the fact of God being present and working, interceding through us to that person. Um, so it's God doing the work. It's not like some magic formula, okay? But it is something that symbolizes God's presence, our presence, their presence, and how those things are all interlocking and feeding into each other. Um, so um, I'm going to go ahead and, and start praying. If any of you want to pray um, something in addition, just grab the mic from me, um, and then I'll ask Paco to close. All right? Let's pray. Dear Holy and Gracious Father, we come to you um, today and we thank you for um, our sister Allie. We thank you, God, for um, just the conviction and the calling that you have placed upon her heart. We thank you, God, for all the hard work that she has put in, all the study, all the learning um, for her to come from Alhambra and um, learn a completely different language and travel to a different country to serve your people there. Um, it's just one of the amazing things that you, that you equip people to do. Um, God, we just ask for protection. We ask for favor um, upon her that you use her, Father, um, to minister and bring light to those who are displaced and who are need in need. Lord, your word says that we are to treat those among us um, who are displaced, who are foreigners, as if they are natural born. We're to treat people, Father, with the same love and care that you have shown to us when we were strangers. And so, Lord, we just pray that, um, that you bless uh, Allie and those she works with, that she would be um, a blessing to the team that she's going to be working with. Um, and we just pray, God, for the people um, that she'll be interacting with. In Jesus' name. Father God, um, you know the condition of the streets of Tijuana, Father God. Um, as I had walked through there uh, when I was a teenager, 19, um, 1990 something, I was uh, 19 and uh, in the military at the time, Father God. Uh, so I have seen the streets of Tijuana, Father God, and I don't know where they are or how the condition has changed over the years, Father God, but you know how it is. So, Father God, I pray your Holy Spirit protects not only Allie, but also the rest of her team and the people that who are on the fringe out there dear lord 
uh, in the streets that are dangerous, um, where, where darkness lurks, dear Lord. Um, you call us to, to be bearers of the light, Father God, and I know that you protect us where you, where you send us, Father God. So I pray in complete confidence and faith of, of, of your promise, um, your faithfulness um, to protect Allie and the whole team as they are in, in, the, in the shadows of Tijuana and all the, all the hurt and all the, all the corruption in the, in the streets and the, the culture that is there, Father God. I pray that you continue to pour into them your Holy Spirit, your goodness, um, the power of your Holy Spirit, dear Lord, to work through them as they are willing. They are willing to go where no one wa else wants to go, dear Lord. Um, I pray that you armor them up in every way, physically, mentally, and spiritually, dear Lord, and that you, you just safeguard them completely. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Thank you, Father God. Amen. Heavenly Father, you are the Lord God Almighty, the creator of all, and we come to you praising you. We thank you for our sister Allie, Lord, and for her and her whole team. We pray that you wrap them all in your mighty hedge of protection, keep them safe and healthy, protect them, provide for them, guide them, watch over them, Lord. We pray that you grant them wisdom to do your will. And Father, just as we were reminded earlier about your protection of Daniel in the lion's den, we know that you can do anything, Lord. We know that you can do this. We pray that you will wrap them all in that mighty hedge of protection, Lord, to keep them safe. Give them the, the ability to do your will. Give them the guidance to do your will as we send them there to bless these people, Lord, your people. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, congratulations, Allie. I think this is something that's an amazing opportunity for you. Prayers for Cain and Kara, because I know they're going to be worrying about you all. <laughs> also the rest of the family. But uh, I think that is the end of our announcements. As always, our prayer station is open and it's available. If you have a prayer that you'd like to discuss or uh, a, you know something you'd like to ask for, uh, we've got Ethan and I just totally blank Connie <laughs> over there. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, Connie and Ethan are over there, or if you just have something you'd like to write down and put on a post-it note, post on the board, um, the prayer team will pray, pray over that as the week goes. All right, and I think that's it for today, so thank you for being here, and we will see you next week.